<laughs> Good morning, everybody. Good morning. My name is Shawnee Washington, and I'm the president and CEO of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. And welcome to A Voice in Action. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Today is a historical occasion because you will hear a firsthand account of legislative history from someone who plays a major role in shaping our public policy, Congressman Shaka Fatah. Let's give him a grand big welcome. This morning's program is part of a series which grew out of the foundation's recognition that we needed to capture and preserve historical contributions of black Americans who have served in the United States Congress. African American Voices in Congress, or A Voice, began as a digital repository for curating letters, memos, policy papers, photos, and other congressional works. It is an important part of the foundation's educational mission and our new permanency initiative to share the contributions of African American legislators and to preserve this history for current and future generations. The website is avoiceonline.org. Hope you will visit us there. We then asked members of the Congressional Black Caucus to contribute by sharing their stories with groups like each of you, the next generation. This is so important because you need to know that 20, 30, and okay, maybe 40, and for some 50 years ago, CB, CBC members were you, except many of them didn't have a CBC to fight for them, nor an experience like the one you're participating in today. So while many of them made history, you all have come along at the right time to share in and be inspired by this rich history. So I ask you to listen to their stories, hear about the work of Congressman Fatah, and decide what will be your contribution to the global black community. Ask yourself, how will you make a difference? Thank you all again for being here, and I hope you enjoy A Voice in Action. It is now my pleasure to introduce you to Adrena Eiffel, our project director for A Voice. Adrena has served as the project director since 2005, shepherding its development and expansion and bringing the often hidden and less widely known but important history of African Americans who have served in Congress. Adrena is a native of Washington, D.C., and she graduated from Williams College, Howard University, and George Washington University. She has more than 20 years of experience in management, marketing, and film production. Please join me in welcoming Adrena. Thank you, Sanchonis. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to A Voice in Action, and this is a really special occasion that you all are here to witness history and get a front row seat in this. Um, the A Voice project aims to harness technology to safeguard and widely disseminate African American legislative history. Soon after we launched online at avoiceonline.org, we talked about how our collective history shapes who we are today. A Voices users then asked us to delve deeper into our archival vaults and bring forth more of the CBC history into a modern day light. Thus, A Voice in Action was born. Today's event is part of a series of small gatherings to be held to discuss topics that were of importance to the CBC at its founding and are still important today. The CBC was founded in 1971 by a group of 13 members of the House of Representatives. Six are still living and two are still in office. We will continue to conduct these gatherings to, to preserve this legacy. Today's topic will be on education policy and we're pleased to have Representative Shaka Fatah here today to discuss his experiences as a member of Congress, a member of the CBC, and an advocate for education for all Americans. On the A Voice website, you can find many documents, letters, artifacts, and histories of black members of Congress. African American legislators have long understood the relationship between education and social advancement in the United States. Please take the time to visit the education policy exhibit on the website. Since its inception, the CBC has taken a leading role in shaping education legislation and reform, paying specific attention to the passage of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act of 1965, its amendments and its reauthorizations. Also notably, Prior to the establishment of the CBC, African American representatives Adam Clayton Powell, Augustus Hawkins, and others rallied to ensure that education equality 
would be afforded to underrepresented minorities. These members of Congress held powerful positions on congressional committees and used their influence to advance the cause of civil rights. Now, mind you, all of this information is online and free to access. All these years later, we can review and discuss how the CBC has played a role and participated in the transformation of education for all students. Now, more about what you're about to witness. Think Oprah's next chapter. <laughs> and you are all privileged to get this front row seat. This event will be videotaped, preserved, and edited and streamed on the Avoice website later. I want to introduce you to our dynamic facilitator for today's program, Dr. Lynn Jennings. She is the legislative associate at the Education Trust, advocating for federal policies that are close the achievement and opportunity gaps between low-income students, minority students, and their peers in K through 12 and higher education. She works specifically on the issues of fair funding, teacher equity, and accountability. Prior to joining the Education Trust team, Lynn worked at the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, where she directed the foundation's fellowship programs for young professionals working on the Hill and was responsible for the strategic development of the foundation's leadership Institute of Public Service. Lynn has taught high school students and on several college campuses in Chicago, Georgia, and Washington, D.C. Her most extensive teaching experiences were at Spelman College, where she earned her bachelor's degree in English, literature, and at the University of Wisconsin and Madison, where she completed her doctorate degree. So now, if everyone would turn all of their mobile devices to silent, but we definitely encourage you to use social media, and the hashtag today is a voice in action. Let's the program begin. Thank you, Rena. Um, and thank you, uh, Congressman Fatah, for sitting down with us this morning. I'm going to do a really brief introduction of you so we can get started. Um, I think everybody wants to talk to you, and I'm e equally um, eager to speak with you this morning. Um, Congressman Shaka Fatah is a senior member of the House Appropriations Committee. This committee is responsible for setting spending priorities of over $1 trillion in annual discretionary funds. Congressman Fatah is a ranking member, which means he's a senior Democrat, on the Appropriations Subcommittee on Commerce, Justice, Science, and Related Agency. The CJS Subcommittee oversees close to $51 billion in discretionary spending for the Departments of Commerce and Justice, NASA, and the National Science Foundation. Congressman Fatah is also the vice chair of the House Gun Violence Prevention Task Force and also serves as co-chair of the Congressional Urban Caucus. Um, some of his, he has many initiatives, but some that I think specifically deal with education are mentoring, the Gear Up program, which I'm sure we're going to talk about, um, and I know that he's done quite a bit on fair funding for schools, which I can't wait to talk to him about. Um, Congressman Fatah is serving his 10th term in the U.S. House of Representatives, is the number one vote getter in 2012. He won re-election with a whopping 300, let me see if I can do this, 318,176 votes. Pennsylvania's second district includes parts of Philadelphia and Montgomery counties. Before his election to the U U.S. Congress in 1994, Congressman Fatah served six years as a representative in the, in the Pennsylvania State House, followed by six years as a state senator. Again, welcome and thank you. It's great to be here. Thank you. <laughs> So we thought we'd start this interview with starting from the beginning, the beginning of your career in Congress. Um, and the number one question that came to mind is, why did you decide to run? Why did you want to become a member of Congress? Why here? Well, I had spent 12 years in the state capitol, a half in the House, half in the state Senate. Uh, I chaired the uh, Education Committee in the state Senate, and I was quite involved in education affairs in Pennsylvania. Uh, but uh, the opportunity arose and, uh, for a, um, a race for Congress. And so I ran because I thought it was very, very important, uh, the work that I was engaged in, that uh, I have a stronger foundation uh, in terms of policy development. And the, the premier lawmaking body in the world is the U.S. Congress. And so I ran, and, uh, and I was successful, uh, not just in winning election, but in the work that I was interested in doing in the Congress. My earliest success was uh, passing the Gear Up program into law, 
which we've now invested over four and a half billion dollars in and 12 million young people have benefited uh, in all 50 states. Um, and I also started to work on uh, school finance equity, you know, how we go about rearranging uh, public school financing so that uh, young people uh, are given a fair opportunity to live up to their potential, that they're giving, given the resources that are needed in terms of quality teachers, classroom size, a rigorous curriculum. Um, the, and so I, I was very interested in doing this work, and the Congress was the best place to do it. Uh, I want to come back to some, uh, some of the things you said about your education and equity, um, but I'm going to take us back again and, and ask the question, do you remember your first day as a member? Oh, absolutely, because this 94 was uh, when I won the election. Uh, at, it was a, um, a landslide year for the other team. So the Republicans had taken the majority for the first time in 40 years. So... Um, uh, that election night was somewhat bittersweet for me. I had gotten elected. I had won with the largest margin uh, um, of anyone in the country, but I was one of uh, about a dozen Democrats. There were about 90 new Republicans who had been elected, and they were going to take the majority. And they had never been, they had not been in the majority in 40 years. So no one actually knew what the Congress was going to look like. So on my first day uh, being sworn in, um, it was a time in which the Republicans were taking all of the leadership positions, and their stated position on education was that they were going to uh, eliminate the Department of Education, that that's what their majority meant uh, in the House. And um, so it was, a, it was a, a circumstance in which if you were impressed by them being in the majority, you would have a different view about what we're going to be able to achieve. The good thing is that we had a president, uh, President Clinton, who was committed to education. Uh, and even though the Republicans had swept the House and taken the Senate, uh, there was, a, there was a, um, a, a, an opportunity through the presidency uh, to uh, at least stop their worst ideas from ever becoming law. And um, President Clinton and I became, uh, 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 you know, partners in an effort to focus in on you know, protecting very vitally important programs in the Department of Education. And the president ended up signing into law the Gear Up uh, program, which I passed in a Republican majority Congress and uh, out of the Senate, and uh, which was occasioned by a major uh, level of excitement among my Democratic colleagues because it was the only Democratic proposal that passed during those Gin Gingrich uh, uh, Republican majority years, um, because for the most part, you know, it was impossible for Democrats to get things done. Okay. Funding works and spending. Well, today in our country, and it's been this way for a very, very long time, uh, if you are a, a young person uh, who comes from a poor or working class family, uh, you are generally going to be in an educational circumstance in which you get the least of everything we know you need to get a quality education. So whether it's in terms of the facilities, the teacher quality, and I don't mean teacher quality as a derogatory point about teachers. I'm talking about teachers who major or minor in the subjects that they're teaching. Uh, so you can have a teacher that loves you, but it's difficult for them to teach you math if the last math course they took was in high school, mm -hmm. if, if they didn't major in math. And for a majority of African-American students and other poor students in our country, they're not going to be presented with a teacher who majored or minored in math for any of their math courses uh, so, or any of their other core uh, uh, subjects. And you've done work at the Education Trust that shows that this is across the nation. I mean, this is not some isolated problem here. And so, but the things we know young people need is they need a rigorous curriculum. They need instructors who know the subject matter. You, you can't teach something to someone that you don't know yourself, all right? And you uh, need an adequate class size. Mm -hmm. So if you look in our wealthy suburban districts, you will find this. You will find that their teaching staff usually have 
uh, graduate degrees in the subjects that they're teaching, not just undergraduate degrees. You will find that the class size is roughly half of what you're going to find in a, a, a big city uh, district like Philadelphia or Chicago. Uh, so anyway, so my interest in education is that what we look at in terms of uh, disproportionate failure as some failure of the young person is not actually the truth. The truth is, is that we've created a system in which they're getting less than a fair opportunity to be successful. Uh, and then, um, you know, and then we kind of suggest because they haven't achieved at the same level as others that therefore we don't need to do anything uh, to provide better opportunities because it's somewhat of a subliminal suggestion that while well, they, they're not going to perform well anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's really a, uh, you know, if someone was designing a system in which poor uh, kids uh, or working class families uh, were going to not do well, this is the system they would have designed. Mm -hmm. And we see that in the K through 12 space and on up through as they're going to access the higher ed, because you've done quite a bit of work in higher ed also and well, making sure there's a Absolutely. I mean, you know, Malcolm X said once, he said, you know, it's a vicious cycle. If you live in a poor community, you go to poorly funded schools. Because schools are funded based on property taxes. So if you live in a poor community, in poorly funded schools, you get a poor education. And then you get a poor paying job. And the only place you can afford to live is in a poor community. And then the same thing happens is that with your children. That's why we don't talk, we talk about generations of poverty mm -hmm. or a generational cycle of poverty. It's a cycle in which it's very difficult to extricate yourself from because of the circumstances that you're in. And so this is why Gear Up is designed the way it's designed. It's designed to um, engage young people for a seven year period to take young people as a group so you're not self-selecting who's going to be successful or not and give every one of them the opportunity to have the resources that they need so they can be successful. And that's why, um, you know, when Harvard looked at it, it said it was the best design education program ever. It's the first one in which you're taking a cohort approach mm -hmm. uh, versus an individual approach. And so I think that that's what we need to be doing in the broader scheme of things. We need to be giving all of our young people the fullest opportunity and many, many more than will be successful. Okay. One last question about this and then I'll move on, like I said, to some of the work you've done of appropriations. But you spoke specifically about Gear Up and you're very much well known for Gear Up. Um, I thought our audience might be interested in some of your work on the Student Bill of Rights, though, um, and perhaps even the American Dream Act account, but particularly the Student Bill of Rights. Well, the Student Bill of Rights is directly connected to this commission. That is to say that what I laid out was my belief in this legislation was that the federal government should be more of a referee. We should say to states, you can't have a... Uh, a dual system or an apartheid system of education, that what you're providing in your best schools, that is in your highest achieving schools, in terms of class size, in terms of quality of teachers, in terms of subject matter, in terms of access to AP courses and uh, other, uh, uh, other uh, 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 resources, you have to provide in your lowest achieving schools. That whatever is good, you know, and uh, in a circumstance where young people are doing well, we should be doing the same thing uh, and, 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 and not creating a situation where we're acting as this is some kind of a, a fast food in which it's all the same except some young people are doing better than the others because it's really not true that the kids who are not performing as well are getting the least qualified teachers. And, and we could go through this in much greater detail, but, you know, Chicago sometimes did an analysis of the teachers in Chicago and if you're an African-American student in Chicago, you are, um, you are six times more likely to have a teacher who failed all five of the basic skill tests in the Illinois teacher's exam. But the Baltimore sometimes did the same ex analysis in Baltimore, the same thing. And Ed Trust did it for uh, uh, all of uh, uh, the, the West Coast in California and found the same circumstance, right? Now again, you gotta make sure you understand my point. I'm not talking about the teacher uh, in a derogatory term. I mean, but if you take a, I had at my uh, high school, 
Uh, we had a, this front page of the Enquirer story a couple of years ago. We had this young lady who graduated in what, art history as an undergraduate degree. She shows up, she gets hired. Principal says, yeah, I don't have an algebra teacher. So guess what? You're teaching algebra this year. And they sit her in there to teach algebra. Well, at the end of the year, she's frustrated. She quits teaching. Mm -hmm. And you, you can tell the students didn't learn a lot from an art history major in terms of algebra, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a, so I'm not making a point about the individual teacher. Right. What I'm saying is that what we have is a situation where states create uh, requirements for teaching math mm -hmm. or science, and then they provide waivers in the school's of kids who don't need to have teachers with waivers. They need teachers who have the actual certification in the subject matter. Right. Why, is this, why was it so important to you to join that committee, the Appropriations Committee? Um, well, you know, we, we need to be aspiring to an opportunity to have an impact. Mm -hmm. So in the Congress, the most powerful committee is the Appropriations Committee. That's where you can have the greatest impact. So it's, um, and I ran for the Appropriations Committee and I lost. Uh, but then I ran again two years later and I won. Uh, so uh, eventually I got there and now I've risen to the top. Uh, and it positions me to have an impact on the things that I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. uh, I get to decide for the whole Democratic Party and the whole Democratic Caucus what our position is, what our priorities are. Uh, and so in the area of science or in the area of uh, uh, economic development um, or any of the other areas covered by my, uh, my bill or the appropriations bill that I'm the ranking member for, uh, I get a chance to have a tremendous impact on what is going to be the priorities for the country um, and uh, on those subject matters. Okay, okay. It gives a sense of some of those priorities for science? Like what well, in science, now? for instance, uh, I'm very interested in making sure that we do more in the area of STEM education, the science, technology, engineering, and math, that we get more young people engaged uh, in uh, pursuing careers in that area. My number one priority is, uh, is neuroscience, brain, brain research. I'm very interested in, um, and I've been, been successful in navigating a major effort um, in neuroscience called the Fatah Neuroscience Initiative, which has brought together for the first time all of the agencies of the federal government focused on uh, three things. the 600 or so diseases and disorders of the brain. So everything from Alzheimer's to autism, bipolar disorder, epilepsy, uh, and the like, to make sure that we can come up with uh, cures and effective treatments uh, for these diseases and disorders. Two, cognitive, uh, that is the learning, uh, you know, how a healthy brain uh, and learns uh, and what we can do to inform teaching and learning uh, through neuroscience. Uh, and then finally, traumatic brain injury. Uh, we have about almost two million young people who, uh, uh, who get severely injured each year, whether it's riding their bike or, you know, mountain climbing or whatever it is that they might be engaged in, um, you know, or being injured in a, uh, a fight or a gunshot to the brain. So these traumatic brain injuries create a major challenge, particularly for the people who are mostly the victims, young people, uh, because they could be in a circumstance in which uh, their brain doesn't function well for the rest of their life. And, um, and it's very costly, and it's obviously a, a major a challenge for them and their families. So I'm interested in those three areas, and I've, uh, we've created this neuroscience initiative. Uh, the president just uh, made a major announcement on this in terms of an uh, uh, effort to literally map the human brain, um, which has never been done before. Because in each of uh, these young people's brains, there are about 100 billion individual neurons with trillions of interconnections and you can talk to Nobel uh, um, award-winning scientists and not one of them can tell you even with their Nobel Prize in neuroscience what one of your neurons actually does. They can tell you what sections of the brain handle visual or 
uh, or memory, but in terms of actual detailed understanding how the human brain works, it is the area of science that we have not yet uh, really engaged uh, on a full on a full uh, on a full effort. So that's one of my interests. But I have a variety of interests. Everything from uh, the uh, commercial space uh, travel uh, to our national laboratories and. Um, which are you know, a major investment of our government in terms of science and, and engineering. So I'm uniquely situated in the sense that I have these interests, but much more importantly, I have the ability to cause action on the things that I want to cause action on. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know, we want more women in science, but well, we've now changed the entire way government funding for young scientists who are women are uh, handled. So before, uh, you know, you couldn't have any interruption in the work. Well, now, if you get married, you're going to have a child, you can have interruption in your work. You can, but without losing your grant and so on, you can have more flexible hours. There's no possibility that we're going to compete with China or other uh, much larger populated countries if we leave women outside of the framework of our science uh, and engineering workforce. So there, there, there are things that... Uh, I can do in my position that uh, are, uh, or, you know, where I can have a true impact mm -hmm. on almost any day on any subject that I might focus on. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and, you know, it does take some cooperation from my colleagues, but it's a lot easier to get that cooperation when you're the ranking member. Um, now I'm going to transition and talk more um, broadly about the CBC, past, present, and um, future. Um, so the Congressional Black Caucus was formed on the heels of the Civil Rights Movement of the 1960s. Talk to us about why it was so important to have a caucus. You know, why it was important to form and organize into a caucus? Well, you had a point when, you know, uh, pre the Voting Rights Act, you had African American members elected to the Congress. But there were, you know, really a handful in uh, what were um, black majority districts in places like Cleveland, Ohio, Lou Stokes, or uh, in Philadelphia with, uh, with Congressman Nix uh, in, in Chicago and so on. So there were a handful. But as the caucus actually started to add members uh, after the Voting Rights Act was passed in 65 and it got to 13, there really was an opportunity for people to start to work together um, and in a need because, you know, you know, as African-American members of Congress, you know, we have some unique responsibilities mm -hmm. uh, because you've got a racial minority group, African-Americans, who were um, the, uh, you know, who were subjected to through law a set of, uh, of restrictions on their uh, activities. Uh, rather, it was, you know, to be able to go to a school. Mm -hmm. You know, so there was a time when you couldn't go to school, you couldn't go to a library, you couldn't register to vote. Uh, you, there, were, there were states you couldn't marry or own land in. I mean, there were a whole set of, of circumstances that occasioned our uh, presence uh, and difficulties, you know, um, over this period. And so as you went through the Civil Rights Movement and you started knocking down these barriers, you know, it's kind of like uh, Dr. King said, well, you know, if you are entered into a race in which everybody else has been able to start running and now you get a chance to run, you got two choices. You either can always be behind everyone else or you got to run faster than everybody else. Mm -hmm. Those are your only two choices, mm -hmm. right? So if you're, you know, so that the, the caucus uh, was in a situation where members were being elected, but they couldn't check into a hotel in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. I mean, they couldn't eat in the members' dining room, even though they were members of Congress. They had to eat in the basement of the Capitol uh, with the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the janitors and the other people who worked in the Capitol, right? So if you were elected um, to Congress... You had to stay with a, a black family in D.C. You had to rent a room, you know, in the house or, you know, I mean, there was no, you couldn't check into, you were in a different, you were in a different situation mm -hmm. 
even though you were identical to other members in, in, in every other respect. Mm -hmm. So there was a reason for members to get together to think about how they might uh, affect change. Uh, and, you know, it's always easier to get things done when you're working as a group than you can as an individual. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and um, so that was the origins of the caucus coming together. And, uh, and it's worked over time. That is to say that major progress has been made, but there are always things to do. When I showed up in 94, when, when I got elected in 94, I showed up in January 95, one of the first things I did was, because um, I, I was appointed to the House Administration Committee, which handles the workings of the Capitol. Because I said, well, look, we've got 1,500 paintings over in the Capitol, and there's not one African American. Uh, so I... I through my work on the committee, I got them to uh, uh, put a portrait of an African American, the first African American ever be elected to Congress, over in the Capitol uh, by order of the House Administration Committee. Mm -hmm. So now that may seem like a, a symbolic thing, but if you think about the millions of school children who take tours through the Capitol, and if they never ever see anybody who looks like them, mm -hmm. out of all of these portraits in the United States Capitol, you know, it kind of subliminally suggested to them that they are not equal to, or that they at least are not in the mix of helping to make or create our country as it might exist today. You know, so um, so the work of the caucus is both, you know, I think it's, it's, some of it may be seen like symbolism, mm -hmm. but it's, you know, and some of it is substantive. But you really need both. You need both the symbol and the substance. So I think the, the um, when I was a, a very young person, a teenager, uh, I came down to the Congressional Black Caucus uh, uh, hearings that John Conyers was holding on. Um, he was holding hearings on juvenile crime issues. Uh, and just to see him sitting there as chairman, uh, you know, on his sub at that time he was chair of a subcommittee on the judiciary. Now he, he rose to the top spot, but it, it was very, very important of what it uh, means to young people. Mm -hmm. So I know that when people see me, um, you know, uh, on the floor of the uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, the control room floor when the Mars rover is landing on Mars at the eight and a half mm -hmm. uh, trip in space, that they might get some sense that, you know, people who look like them have something to do with the, the country's space activities, right? Mm -hmm. it, it, it sends messages that may not be able to be uh, understood fully at the moment, but it suggests that they, too, can have an impact. Okay. Everything that I do uh, has a uh, purpose in mind, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, first and foremost, you know, I just won re-election. I've now been in an elected office for 30 years, uh, even though I'm a young person. Right. Uh, <laughs> and I won, I got elected with the largest number of votes uh, than anyone in the history of the country to the United States Congress. So I, I've both been doing this for three decades, and, I, and I'm in a very strong political position in my district. I don't mean that, that, that you take people for granted, but I mean, I, if I can't take time to, uh, um, to affect change, for instance, at the foundation mm -hmm. and help the foundation meet its goals, you know, some member who's in a very tough re-election battle who just barely got re-elected, they don't have time, you know, to uh, donate to the foundation, uh, contribute to the foundation. So, you know, I serve as chair. It's not a paid position. It takes time. It takes energy. It's a, uh, it, but it is a requirement of those of us who are successful to give of ourselves, to make the effort, make the sacrifices, because that's how we got to where we are, that there were people who made sacrifices and did things that created the opportunities for us. So I see my work at the foundation um, as an opportunity uh, to uh, kind of give forward uh, to uh, future generations of uh, young people who will get more opportunity in terms of fellowships, internships, scholarships, 
that the work of the foundation on the policy level uh, is going to be strengthened, and that uh, I'm, with the permission of our president and CEO, you know, we're launching a major effort that's going to be focused on creating the foundation as the center, the indispensable centerpiece of uh, African American permanence here in Washington in terms of public policy. That is that we don't want to be fleeting. Mm -hmm. We're going to always have interest in what's going on here in Washington. So, you know, President Obama is going to come and go. I'm going to come and eventually I'm going to go. Mm -hmm. And um, so, but whether people are serving one term or 20 terms, they're going to be just passing through. The foundation is going to be here. And we want to create a situation where African Americans, whether they're in a district like mine, where they have the most capable member ever representing them, <laughs> or if they're in a district that, like in Omaha, Nebraska, where that's never elected an African American and may not in our lifetime, but that they still, as an African American educator, can get information about the reauthorization of the Elementary Secondary Act. Or if they are a African American farmer and interested in the farm bill and what's going on with that, or the immigration bill, that the foundation should really be a vehicle where people can always know that they're getting authentic information mm -hmm. about what's actually going on, not some politician spin on what's going on, but what is actually going on, what's actually in the bill. Uh, or in the new law, or what's happening with the implementation of a new law, right? So that I see this as a, as, as a very important work. So that's why I've uh, I decided uh, to, uh, to offer myself, and I was elected by my colleagues on the board of the foundation, um, to lead the foundation at this time. Because I think that I'm in a position to lead, uh, and, uh, and I have the uh, ability. And so, you know, to do less than your best, I think is a sin. Mm -hmm. you, know, uh, you know, we should do our best to, uh, to, be a, to have an impact. Mm -hmm. And uh, I see the foundation as a, an opportunity for me to have a much greater impact than just my work, even though my work is, you know, is very, very significant. Mm -hmm. It's still my work, and it's related to appropriations and spending money, that people are paying in taxes on things that I think that are very important for the country. But the foundation is a much more important vehicle because it will be here much longer than I'm going to be here in Washington. African American purchasing power will be 1.1 trillion by 2015. So, my question is, what is the uh, the African American community in, on the Capitol Hill on Capitol Hill doing to uh, make sure that we're using this purchasing power and that we're uh, fiscally responsible? Well, I think there are a number of things inherent in your question. First of all, is that no matter what we may think about our situation. In terms of African ancestry uh, people all throughout the world, we are the wealthiest. We are the most highly educated. We are the healthiest. Uh, and we are the ones most capable of affecting, um, affecting the world in terms of you know, any range of issues, right? So African Americans are uniquely situated because we're in the wealthiest country in the world. So, you know, even if you were the poorest African American family in America, you're so much uh, uh, financially and educationally and other ways, even with what I've said about our schools and everything else, comparatively speaking, right? So that we have this opportunity in our purchasing power to just a lot of that, right? So a trillion uh, is a lot of money. You know, a trillion dollars, a thousand billion dollars, and a billion dollars, a thousand million dollars. A trillion dollars, a lot of money, right? And so it, if you took that money, that would be the most wealthiest, um, you know, be one of the most wealthiest countries in the world. It'd be in the top 10, you know? 
Well, it's sixteenth then. Okay, so in terms of all of the nations in Africa, it will be number one by a large uh, margin, right? So it is a very significant purchasing power. But the issue with purchasing is you're a consumer, and what does that mean? That that means and you can be an informed consumer. You know, you can try to. We have a tendency sometimes to boycott our own businesses. So you know, if if you know, in terms of uh, professionals, African American lawyers, doctors. Uh, uh, dentists, uh, and so on, you can try to use your purchasing power uh, to support professionals in our own community. We have other business people who are in all ranges of businesses. Uh, but that's part of the work that the foundation is going to do in this permanent initiative is to try to uh, help us navigate our way uh, through some of this. But the other thing is that we're all going to purchase with non-minority non-African-American-owned businesses. So, you know, I mean, and whether it's a big box a re- a retailer or whatever it may be, you can help them think about their responsibilities. As you're purchasing, you can, as a customer, ask them, you know, are they in their, you know, are they using black designers for any of their clothing lines? You know, are they using, uh, you know, if they're, if they're running, a, a, you know, a bookstore? Are, are they, do they have an African-American literature? Section. I mean, so there are always things you can do as a consumer because businesses are always very interested in what you have to say. And so there are lots that we can do. But part of this has to do with financial literacy. And part of it has to do with our own determination to have an impact. So let me give you an instance. The foundation has financial resources. So we've just taken a decision as a board to now uh, share our wealth and deposit our resources in uh, about 20 African-American-owned banks in the country, right? That's a informed, that's, that's what you do as a, you know, now we're a consumer of financial services. We have to bank somewhere, right? But we've decided to bank in a way that will strengthen these local banks. Mm-hmm. That is that we're giving them money that they can hold on to, that that they can uh, invest in small business loans and other things. And the foundation will earn a few dollars from this, but it will also strengthen all of those communities. So wherever you might find yourself, whether it's an individual consumer, whether you're in a position to control the uh, bank book for a business, whether it's your own business or your family's inheritance, I mean, there are always ways you can use that money smartly that create a broader benefit. All right, thank you, Congressman, for being with us today. Um, my name is Roy Sean Filson. I am interning in the Honorable James E. Clyburn's office from the 6th District of South Carolina. Um, my question kind of hints at education. You spoke of the success of Gear Up and possibly it being a model for a successful approach for education overall in the United States. Um, so I wanted to know your view or any ideas you had at how the federal government should approach education because as of now, states and states seem to have more of their hands on education. And as you hinted at, the way we fund education through property taxes tends to increasingly promote disparities in different regions and school systems who don't have as high property value taxes as others. So I was wondering what approach you think might could kind of eliminate some of those disparities. Well, the first thing is I'm going to be slightly long-winded on this because it's critically important. There's nothing more important than education in terms of uplifting our communities or our country. Uh, so. This is not a new finding. President Nixon set up a school finance commission 40 years ago, and they issued a report. It's called the Nixon School Finance Commission Report, right? And in the executive summary, it says that as long as the nation has a property tax-funded school system, poor kids are going to get jerked. Now, they didn't use the word jerk. Poor kids are going to, this is said verbatim, per, poor kids are going to disproportionately fail, okay? Ten years ago, the Ohio Supreme Court said that black students in Ohio and poor students in Ohio were going to disproportionately fail as long as the state continued to have a property tax-funded school system. So 
This is not like some new finding. As long as you fund schools based on local property taxes, wealthier communities are going to have wealthier funded schools. You know what I mean? It's just that simple. And poor communities are going to be at the opposite end of that. So I think that the federal government needs to do something radically different. One is we need to see education as a national imperative rather than as a local prerogative. Mm -hmm. There should not be this notion that it doesn't matter to any of us how smart or dumb you want to be about education policy in your community, right? That it actually matters to all of us. Like, here we are, a country of 300 million. We now have an emerging superpower uh, coming onto the set, China. A billion plus people. They are determined to eat our lunch economically. They intend to compete with us militarily, all right? And in every other aspect. They just launched their first space, uh, astronauts in the space, right? The other day, they, they, they're coming on the scene. And I don't have any problem with that. I'm for competition. I think competition is healthy, right? But there's no possibility you can have 300 million people compete with a billion plus if we then say a third of our young people we're going to leave in the shadows, mm -hmm. that we, we don't care if they learn algebra or calculus or we don't care if they become engineers or live to their God-given potential, there's no, we already have a differential, right? And now we're going to leave less, some of our talent on the sideline. That doesn't make any sense. So I think we should be much more like the Olympics where we go to compete in the Olympics we don't say, well, we don't want any brothers to show up to play basketball. Mm -hmm. You know, or we, we're going to give, we're going to concede all those gold medals. We're not going to have any women compete mm -hmm. in any of the sports. We don't say that. We say, whoever's got the talent, you come and demonstrate it in the trials, and you're the best that the country can put forward, that's who we're putting forward. It's a much more, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a much better way to go forward as a country. And we actually end up winning all, you know, the majority of the gold medals, um, you know, in all of these fields because we actually allow our best to come forward. Mm -hmm. And we don't discriminate. We don't prejudge. We don't give you the worst of training. You get the best training. You know what I mean? We, you get good coaches. You get uniforms. I mean, it's like we're now feeling, if you think about it, it's kind of like you would take a, a group of kids and say, okay, you have to go play Major League Baseball. You don't get any gloves. You don't get any bats. You don't get any coaches, right? Mm -hmm. You just go out there and play against the, the Washington Nationals or, you know, even the Philadelphia Phillies. We're having a tough year. But, you know, it would be unfair, right? But that's what we're doing now because there are young people in South Carolina who don't have a textbook that's been printed in their lifetime, mm -hmm. who don't have a teacher that made your mind in the subject they're teaching, mm -hmm. right? And then you want them to compete for the best prizes in life. What college they're going to get into. You know, they got to take the SATs. It's, it's not a fair system. So I, what I think is the country has to make a decision that Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, Mississippi, we don't care. Algebra is algebra. That's number one. That the curriculum has to be rigorous and, and, um, and um, that's what this whole common core effort is about. Mm -hmm. Where we've gotten about 45 or so of the governors now to agree that we're going to create a common core curriculum. So the Republicans say you can't have a national curriculum because the national government shouldn't be mandating education. So we've gotten all these governors to agree voluntarily by getting their businesses to threaten them mm -hmm. with moving out of their states and other bad things that might happen if they don't agree. Because we have to raise the standards. That, so that if you do get an algebra and you do get an algebra teacher, we need to know whether you learned the subject, right? And so we need to have, but we can't have uh, it be watered down in some way. We have to make sure that it is at a standard so that we all know what we're all talking about, about where we are in this, this business of education. So Common Core is one. Two is we need to think about how we might fund our schools. And there are ways to think about this. Now, there's a state in our country, it's called Hawaii, that is not even a contiguous piece of land. It's hundreds of little islands and stuff. They have one school district for the whole state and one per pupil expenditure. Now, and 
my state, we have 501 school districts. In Arkansas, which is one of the smallest states in the union, at one point they had 1,700 school districts. And I'll tell you what a Republican said. She was the elected school superintendent for Arizona. She said that the reason why these states have so many school districts is to make sure that wealthy people can guarantee that not one dollar they're spending in taxes go to educate a poor child. So you, you go to a state where they have one house and it'll be a school district. You know, because they're guarding against their money going somewhere else. So we need, we got to change the system. There's no reason to have all these school districts, okay? We need, unless you're trying to create an an equal playing field. You know, why would you in Texas be spending 4,000 per people in one district, and then you go outside of Fort Worth, uh, um, and you're spending... 30,000 per pupil in that district. So if you're spending $30,000 in first grade, second grade, third grade, four, all the way through, and then you want these two kids to both apply to the state university system in Texas, and then you want to be surprised that the kid that came out of the poor district, they had a few less points on the test than the kid who came out of the district where you're spending 30000 per pupil. Well, when you, you know, now we don't actually spend money per pupil, but that's what the school gets. You actually spend it per classroom. So when you start thinking about what that means, in Philadelphia it means in our suburbs, they spend on average about 150000 more per classroom per year, every year from the first day the kid shows up to 12 years later. So you know what you could do with $150,000 more per classroom? You could cut the class size in half. You could hire a more qualified teacher. You could actually give out laptops or maybe even a textbook that was printed in the kid's lifetime. I mean, you know, you could have a a more safer environment. So anyway, we need to change the system, and we should not compromise on this. This is very, very important because you're handicapping people from their very first day all the way through. And that doesn't, what they'll say, well, so-and-so succeeded because they always want to point to the exception. We can't, this is not a discussion about exceptions. This is a discussion about fairness. If the state's going to mandate that you take algebra, you should get a teacher who knows algebra to teach you. Uh, good morning, Congressman. My name is Nicholas Cunningham, um, Office of Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton, and I had two questions. Um, one is, what are some of the steps we could take besides uh, changing a national or implementing a national curriculum to uh, uh, implement STEM programs in, within our local um, school systems here? And the second one is, uh, what is, what is happening with uh, foreign language education? Why are, why are students not learning foreign languages today? Hello, Congressman Fatah. My name is Janice Gentry, and I'm interning with Congresswoman Terry Sewell of District 7 of Alabama, and I have two questions. Um, What methods do you recommend in encouraging the interests of minorities in the sciences, technologies, mathematics, and engineering fields in grade school? And also, with all the budget cuts, how do you see, well, where do you see the funds going in the future as far as the Gear Up program? So what can be done to ensure that we retain access to these funds? Um, there's a young black woman who is uh, the uh, Harvard Scientist of the Year. Uh, she's just developed a, 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 um, she's developed a soccer ball that when you kick it, it's got a little uh, uh, rechargeable battery in it, and it actually takes the energy from the strike or from the kick, and it, it stores it inside the ball, right? And, um, and they make these balls in Long Island, New York. And, um, and this is the, you know, in sub-Saharan Africa and some of the other poorest areas in the world, kids can't do their homework because they don't have any electricity. Electricity is just not available. So in the evenings they can't. So this soccer ball stores up to three hours of light. And you can take it inside the house, and then you can use it for, you know, reading and do your homework and everything. It's a wonderful invention, right? There's an African-American woman named Patricia Bath who, uh, 
who uh, developed all of the techniques that we use in uh, cataract uh, eye surgery now. And she got the patents for it. She, she could have made millions, but she took the money from the patents and put it into a foundation to help people who were going blind, right? Um, and there's, there, there's so many other examples I could point to you that I think really at the heart of how we get more people interested in science. That is to say that what we have to do is science has to be relevant, number one. You know, it can't be some, you know, philosophical uh, notion. We've got a, so there's a black woman who developed fiber optic uh, networks. I mean, she invented them. We all use them for broadband and stuff now, but she actually invented this whole technique, right? So we had to show our young people all of the examples. So one of the things I did in my appropriations were I controlled the, um, or I helped control the appropriations for the patent office. So I now had them start a process where we're going to identify by county every patent holder in the country from the beginning of the country so that we can share that with local school districts so that the school district can say that there was a person who grew up in your county who developed a patent for this or that or whatever, right? Because we need to get more young people interested in becoming inventors. And if they become interested in invention, inventors, they will become interested in science. They will become interested in engineers. We just did a package, a program with uh, uh, FIRST Robotics in the Boys and Girls Club. Uh, in fact, my chief of staff, Ms. Leek, I negotiated the deal to take the premier engineering development program in the country and have it introduced into 4,000 Boys and Girls Clubs nationwide. It's a $100 million effort, but it's going to pay, I mean, just priceless dividends to the country. And I've seen it in work. You can go up on YouTube and see this in my district, Boys and Girls Club, First Robotics, where these, these uh, First Robotics kids come in and they take uh, toothbrushes and they cut them in half, they put a little battery on the top, and they, they wire it up and they put it on the floor and it starts running around. And they tell these young four- and five-year-olds, hey, here's, here's a robot. And they see this thing running around. And then eventually they get interested. So I think that's what we need to do. We need to make science, engineering, and math relevant to young people where they are through actual examples of people who've done things or are doing things, right, that matter. And uh, also we need to give them a historical view that people from their circumstances, if they're women, there's a young woman out of a new, uh, lady out of New York who developed these, uh, these uh, um, very small batteries that go into... Um, uh, automatic defibrillators you can put into your chest if you have a bad heart. And so if your heart stops working, the battery starts working on this thing and it keeps you alive, right? Those are the kinds of examples we need to bring mm -hmm. to light, mm -hmm. particularly to get people who are not engaged to be engaged about what it is that they might do. Um, and so that, that's, the, in, in terms of the budget cuts and all that, I think that we need to argue that the country cannot afford to go backwards in this area. China just, and I only mentioned China, don't, don't, don't misunderstand, but it's a good example of what competition can do, right? So China just decided six years ago to create 100 science-only universities and 200 math and science universities. And five years later, every single one of them is built and open. They're going to graduate 250 million young people from college. That's almost the entire population of our country, okay? Just so we're all clear, right? So if you want your children and your grandchildren to live in a world in which America is number one, we got to all run faster. We all have to do more. The country can't afford to do less. And that's the argument. We need to stop arguing this stuff on some charity basis. We argue about the country's competitiveness. Its long-term ability to be competitive requires that people who have been previously written off, we need to write them back in. And that's simple, and it's in the country's interest. Good morning, Congressman. My name is Yannick Campbell. I am interning in the office of um, Representative Yvette Clark, New York District 9. And my question to you, you said earlier that we need to be both of symbol and of substance. So what advice do you have for young people to become more civically engaged? 
what do I recommend about getting people more civically uh, active and engaged? Is first of all, I think that activity and engagement should be um, be promoted in a way in which it's uh, understood to be of importance to your own uh, development. That is to say that it is not just you helping somebody else. You're going to get more help. One of the things we know from uh, what we call learn and serve programs where we get high school students to tutor uh, middle school students or middle school students to tutor elementary school students is that both the grades of both group of students go up. The high school students who would have normally been... Um, you know, maybe uh, in ways that we might not want them to be acting, act better. Mm -hmm. Because now they think, oh, these young people are looking up to them. It's mm -hmm. an amazing thing. Uh, less profanity, less fights, less everything that's bad, more of everything that's good. Because what you find out is that when you're helping other people, the person who's getting the most help is you. Mm -hmm. So, you know, civic engagement, if you get involved in your church, you're going to become a better speaker. You're going to become a better organizer. You know, if you have to you know, write for a local ne a newspaper or for your school newspaper, you're going to be a better able to command your thoughts. So that whatever you do, you're going to get as much out of it as somebody else is going to get out of it, number one. Number two, it's a whole lot more fun to be engaged than not engaged. Uh, you know, and life is about having an impact and being fully engaged. So, you know, um, and, and, I, and I think you should be fully engaged in every aspect of your life. I mean, it's not just all work. It's, you know, it's everything across the board. And I'm as active in my personal life as I am in my work life, you know. So if I get home, yeah, I was home this weekend. We went to see the Motown, the musical in New York. Uh, it was awesome. Uh, you know, I'm going to jump out on the golf course. I'm going to do, like, this is the only life you're getting. This is not a dress rehearsal, all right? This is it, all right? So, you know, if you don't take full advantage of every single opportunity to enjoy this life, you're doing less than your best. And I told you before, I think that's, that's a sin before God. Wow. Wow. So thank you all. Well, thank you. <laughs> right. Thank you. Right. Yeah.